Strategic and International Studies. Thank you all for coming out on this really rainy day. So, uh, but uh, I know it's not just for me, it's uh, for our esteemed guest, Dr. Zarabo, and uh, for all of you who believe that we really need a comprehensive test ban treaty. Before I launch into the formal introduction, I just need to make a few administrative notes. Please, if you have <coughs> a cell phone, turn the ringer off. Um, this session will be on the record, and it's being simultaneously webcast. And um, it is our custom here at CSIS. Uh, if there is an emergency, we will alert you. And Yukari Sekaguchi, who's in the back, raise your hand. She'll be the person that you follow and pay attention to. So um, a comprehensive test ban treaty is a critical prerequisite on the path to nuclear disarmament. Uh, you all know that we have a limited test ban treaty, which was uh, signed uh, <clears throat> in the year of my birth, um, which limited tests in the atmosphere and underwater and outer space. But what has eluded us for many, many years uh, has been a comprehensive test ban treaty without which we cannot really ever achieve nuclear disarmament. Um, I notice in our, um, in our um, description of this event, there's actually a mistake. It said that CTBT was signed almost 20 years ago. It's more than 20 years ago. It was in 1996. But it still hasn't entered into force. Uh, some might look at the CTBT and the CTBT organization, CTBTO, as, well, they're just kind of sitting around not doing anything. But exactly the opposite is true. Um, CTBTO has been doing a lot of really important things in science and technology, um, and it plays a very important role in the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty review cycle. And um, here to tell us about that today is none other, uh, none other than Dr. Lucina Zerbo, who is the Executive Secretary of CTBTO. And he has been in that position since August of 2013. He has been instrumental in cementing CTBTO's position as the world's center of excellence for nuclear test ban verification. And I can attest, actually, you were not the executive secretary at the time, but it was Tibor Toth. When I went to CTBTO with a, a delegation of congressmen and senators, and they sat there in awe looking at all the data streaming across your uh, screens. Um, Dr. Zerbo is a geophysicist <laughs> in, uh, by training. Um, and in 2013, he was awarded Arms Control Person of the Year. But he has many, many other honors. They're all listed on the back side of our piece of paper. Um, and But without further ado, I'd like to hand the podium over to him. Welcome. Thank you, Sharon. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Sharon, when you say I'm a geophysicist by training, I often say now that I used to be a geophysicist because I don't know what I am today. Uh, I'm a, a mix of... Uh, listening, learning, and then not knowing exactly what I should uh, uh, teach people. But anyway, uh, Sharon, thank you. And uh, to you personally, and then to the Center for Strategic and International Studies uh, for inviting me, especially these times, you know, when uh, you have, uh, uh, in this part of the world, uh, people inviting you to talk about the CTBT. As I told Sharon, I don't want to miss any opportunity because it's important to come and uh, and talk about the relevance of the treaty, the relevance of the, the international monitoring system, and uh, for people to know more about what we do and what we've been doing for the past 20 years in Vienna, and then why uh, it's worth spending money on this organization and believing in its verification regime or system in the build-up. So it's nearly 60 years ago that uh, scientific experts uh, from eight countries, including the United States, uh, met in Geneva uh, to work on uh, technical aspects of 
what was conceived as a control system to monitor a complete prohibition on atmospheric, underwater, and underground nuclear test explosion. So the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty and its verification regime today are a fruit of the international cooperation that took place over the following decades, providing that the science and diplomacy can work hand in hand in securing a more stable and peaceful future for all. And in fact, uh, last December, we celebrated or commemorated together with the United States 60 years of nuclear test monitoring technologies at the Senate. And that was a great opportunity uh, to brief uh, senators and the public on what was done uh, for so long and that has contributed to making the international monitoring system of the CTBT in Vienna what it is today. Uh, I mentioned this and I mentioned December in the US because the US has contributed and continue to contribute a lot in making the technologies for nuclear test monitoring uh, what they are and what people see and what Secretary Kerry say, one of the wonderful achievements of the modern world. But the treaty represents today 183 countries and that's what I was telling somebody uh, just now that I don't work for two countries or five countries, I work for 183 countries. Uh, it's not easy because you have to make them all happy. And then when none of them are happy, it means you're doing a great job. So you have 183 countries uh, that have signed the treaty, 166 that have ratified, and uh, that has solidified a strong international norm against nuclear testing. Over the last 20 years, the treaty verification regime has increasingly benefited from international expertise. Now, as an example, uh, in this room, I see Pierce Gordon. I think it needs not to be reminded that the United S uh, States, not only through people like Pierce Gordon, who has been, Pierce was director of administration, but he was more of a, a scientist lost in administration in Vienna, but uh, he used to, I remember when I was director of IDC, he used to come and talk to me about the technologies. And then I was wondering, I mean, you director of administration, what can you teach me or tell me about uh, the monitoring technology? But little did I know at that time that Pierce is indeed a geophysicist too, or used to be. But Pierce and uh, many of the experts in the United States have helped this monitoring system to be a strong, strong, and something that the international community is proud of today. So let me tackle some of the achievements we've made over the, the 20 years. So starting the adoption and support for the CTBT and the successful development of the verification regime was only possible due to more than half a century of science and innovation in nuclear test monitoring research and development. Sharon mentioned science and technology, but let me remind you guys that we have a series of science and technology conferences that happen every two years in Vienna at the Hofburg Palace. Uh, science and technology conference that have taken over what the monitoring research review conference that used to happen, I mean, often in Tucson, but that was led by many, uh, by the Department of Energy. Now, we've basically uh, brought them all in Vienna, and then Megan is uh, one of the uh, usual suspects of this conference, so they come and uh, work with us and then work on research and technology to help us uh, think a little bit out of the box. Because the reason why I say this is the longer we stay in Vienna, the more we start thinking that uh, we know it all and then we can learn from nobody. But that's why those science and technology series are to remind us that there is still a lot to learn. And then that's uh, next June, we have uh, the next one in Vienna. And then you are all welcome to join the beautiful city of Vienna to witness what our technology has have evolved in nuclear test monitoring. So thanks to this technical cooperation between the CTBTA and its uh, 183 member states today, international effort to implement the CTBT have brought what we call a mass infusion of energy and resources into nuclear test monitoring science and research. When I say mass, I mean it, because uh, here's a, uh, an organizational framework where you have about 80 different nationalities of experts working together, sharing expertise and experience to make what the international monitoring system is today. To a point where, where we stand today, our detection capability of 
this regime or this system that we're building has now shown an effectiveness that goes far below or beyond what was anticipated during the negotiation. So we often talk about 92% completed, but 92% completion seems to be more effective than what was anticipated with 100%. What that means, it means that if we reach the 100% of the international monitoring system, we'll go even lower, and that's what we need. Going lower, we need that because, you know, there are often discussions about where and how the CTBT, uh, the concept itself is. Are we talking about whatever yield or whatever the CTBT and its international monitoring system can detect? And that's a topic that we can have during the discussion, and I'll come back to this. So we have achieved great success in the build-up of the treaty. I've talked about the 100% are supposed to be 337 facilities and 250 communication nodes. So 92% is now up and running with a much lower detection threshold. So the detection threshold rings a bell because we're dealing now with the DPRK. Uh, often people ask me, but why didn't you confirm with radionuclear detection that the DPRK, uh, what they tested or the event that was detected in the peninsula is effectively a nuclear test explosion? Two things and two answers to this point. First is that the role of the organization is not to certify that indeed it's a nuclear test explosion. Our role is to make sure we put at your disposal all the technical specification for you to make your own conclusion. But now, indeed with social media and media and press, what happened is that people want us to say, they call me at three o'clock in the morning, we want you to tell us if it's a nuclear test explosion. So when you start telling them, no, we've detected an event, a suspicious event. And yes, a suspicious event, but we want to know, is it a nuclear test explosion? People even tend to forget that we're dealing with four technologies that complement each other, seismic, hydroacoustic, infrasound, and that is only the radionuclear technology that brings the smoking gun for us to give the qualitative nature of the event. But social media and media are not that patient. What they want is immediately they think that in the 30 seconds after an event, we're able to say it's a nuclear test. But luckily, for the tests in the DPRK, they often announce and then they do it, but not quite sure. In the past, they used to do it a day before, two hours before, but recently, they only talk about it after two hours later. But the two hours later gives time to the international monitoring system to give you an indication that at least you're not dealing with a natural event in the, pen, in the peninsula. So that gives you an indication that already, if it's not a natural event and it could be an explosion and we know what, how suspicious this peninsula can be, media have already an indication of what they can or that, may the, that might be the conclusion. But mentioning this leads me to another point which is, what if DPRK wasn't even talking about its test? What if we detect an event and then for days and days nobody mentioned we see the event is somewhere in a certain location and nobody claims that they've conducted a test. That's when maybe we'll start knowing the importance of the international monitoring system and the treaty itself. I hope not to reach a time or a position where will now start detecting event and then nobody claiming it, and then we're wondering what has happened in a, part in a specific loca geographical location of the globe. Let's hope not to be in that situation. But what I've learned as well is that this 21st century and this world is about dealing with crisis. We tend to wait for crisis before we find or we think about a solution. Maybe if we have a situation where there's an event and nobody claims it, and that event is not where people suspect or expect it to be, then people will start wondering, hey, by the way, this international monitoring system means something to us. We need not only the international monitoring system, but maybe it is time that we think about the treaty itself, its entry into force, to be in a situation where we avoid completely people being in a situation where they could conduct tests. And this is what I'm guessing 
might happen because uh, when they talk about the six texts by the DPRK, the time we're all expecting the test, it's not the time they do it. So they basically put us, I mean, we put several dates that the international community said this is the day it will happen. Everybody should be on alert, but we are on alert 24 seven anyway. We don't wait to hear about what's happening in the DPRK because we're not focusing on a specific region. We're focusing on the entire planet. We're monitoring the entire planet. Whatever an event happens, we suppose to make sure that no nuclear test explosion goes undetected. And this is what we do. And this is what we try to do for the Korean Peninsula. But I'm getting worried and worried because if they didn't go where and when we expected, it means that we could be in a situation one day where they might test and not even mention it. That's probably the next step. If I follow how the five tests have been, saying it before, saying it after, they might be now in the situation where they don't even want to talk about it. And then the international community will start wondering where and how. The where and how is where we come. Because what we do, a country, a single country cannot come and say, we detected an event or a suspicious event in a specific geographical part of the globe and we think it's a nuclear test explosion, and then we want the international community to believe us. That's where you need a system like the International Monitoring System. You need an organizational framework like the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty to give you the credibility, the legitimacy, and reliable information for you to make your own decision. And this is why we are and we remain important. You've spent money, you've invested money in this wonderful endeavor, and then we should make sure we maintain and sustain it for the international community. This system is there for you. It's there for everybody to know what about and where about nuclear potential nuclear test explosion could be. And now that leads me to where and how far we can detect. I mentioned among the five, the five tests, we're able to detect or to give a combination of radionuclate and, uh, and, and waveform on three cases, 2006, no, I think in two, 2006 and 2013. And the 2013 was actually 54 days after the event, plus or minus three. 54 days because there as well we had a, an hypothesis that uh, potentially somebody must have been doing a, a maintenance at the site that created a path and that's why we had the radionuclear component that could be correlated to the Korean Peninsula. But does it mean that the IMS is not working well? I don't think so. You have to keep in mind that we still have to build some station at important part of the globe. There were stations that were not in working condition when this DPRK test happened. So we have to make sure those stations are all up and running, and this is what we did, particularly this time. We were ready, more ready than we were in 2013, more ready than we were in 2009, because as time goes, the international monitoring system becomes stronger and stronger. And this is what we're trying to do. Getting and securing more stations to be built, more facilities to be secured in remote places in the world. And we've secured two stations in the Galapagos Island. That wasn't easy. But today, the government of Ecuador is proud, together with us, to have let us build those two stations because they contribute indeed to the detection capability of the international monitoring system. But more importantly, we're securing data from China. We've certified a station from China in December. After 15 years of discussion, 15 years of build that, and 15 years of negotiation. And we're planning to certify four more stations this year with China. So this is what we should maintain and sustain. We should make sure we keep this. The risk is, how can we keep the momentum, not only in the build-up of the station, but in sustaining what we've built for the past 20 years? That's the biggest challenge of this organization today. One challenge is indeed the entry into force, but the biggest challenge today is maintaining and sustaining the international monitoring system and the build-up of the verification regime. So today as well, after 20 years, what used to be a one-way stream whereby states that have expertise in nuclear test monitoring will uh, 
give and share experience with the CTBT and the organization framework in Vienna. Now it's both way. And it tends to even be more our way towards state than state towards the CTBT because we have the know-how and the expertise now in Vienna. For a simple reason, most of those experts have joined the organization anyway. And then by exchanging and sharing knowledge and experience with people from so many different nationalities and so many types of experience, they've improved. And that's why today we are a center of excellence in nuclear test monitoring, and we're proud of that. Because we're proud of that, we want every country to use it at its best. And the United States is one of the countries. They pay about 19 to 20% of the contribution of the organization. But they're taking about 20 to 22% of the share of data that we're gathering in Vienna for the international community. That's not bad. You pay 20 and then you get 22%. So, but saying this, I'm, I'm not trying to say that they should have 20, 22% of the staff of the organization because some people tend to think that uh, your contribution in percentage should be equal to the number of staff you have in the organization. If that was the case, I know you guys know that I wouldn't be there as executive secretary, okay? Because Burkina Faso's contribution is probably point, 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 something. Okay, so that's not, it's not equivalent. But anyway, what I'm saying is that we appreciate U.S. contribution to the international, to build up of the international monitoring system. We're working closely with the Air Force Technical Center, St. Patrick, in Florida. This is a place that I visited as director of international data center probably 10 times. So when people ask me, what do you regret today as executive secretary? I say, not going to Florida every year <laughs> in December. Because I used to run from Vienna in December to go to Florida uh, for our annual technical meeting, but I don't do that anymore as executive secretary. So that's one of my biggest regrets. But anyway, that's why I loved my job as international data center director. So, but not only Air Force Technical Center, but we've been working with the labs. I'm sure few of you know that the Nevada National Security Center, we have an agreement with the government of the United States to have that as the training center for our on-site inspectors, our surrogate inspectors. And that's something I think we'll have about 100 people coming uh, this year to work on the technology, nuclear test monitoring technologies in Nevada, a place where we have indeed invited as well a number of diplomats from Vienna to go and witness what the United States is doing, how they're using a former nuclear test explosion site for scientific and research development for something else. Indeed, people talk about your simulation, but often we have to try and make a difference between what is simulation today and what is the framework of the CTBT. Okay, and that's something that I find difficult to explain in my part of the world because it's difficult to tell people that while others are doing simulation, the ones have been told not to develop even weapon. And it's a difficult topic. You know, when you go to Addis Ababa, when you brief the Africa Union, or when you go to Latin America and then you talk to people in that part of the world, people tell you, but what is this treaty? This treaty that allows people, some, to have nuclear weapon and then others not to have. Then you have to try challenging this explanation by, I mean, this uh, statement by saying, look, the beauty of this treaty is that it started somewhere where five were known and recognized to have nuclear weapon. And then the point was how to make sure that no more weapon are in this planet, nuclear weapon I mean, and how to stop those who have it to not modernize their weapon or develop more powerful weapon by a treaty and a verification regime that is the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. When I say this, some can argue that the nuclear test, the CTBT, doesn't stop the development of nuclear weapon. They will say it constrains it. But constraint is already start, we're starting somewhere. Constraint might lead to not allowing the development. And that's the beauty of this treaty. And we have to think about if the CTBT didn't exist, if the international monitoring system didn't exist, and the answer would be easy, we would invent it, but that's not the easiest answer that we should take. If it didn't exist, 
we would probably have more nuclear weapon state today than we had, than we have. And that's something that we should acknowledge, that we should know and accept that this international monitoring system, this treaty, and the buildup of its verification regime has been a strong stop, has put a, a strong stop to more nuclear weapon states in this world. We have, we hear that some are, and we don't want to talk about them, but we have to be proud that we've managed to contain the development of more states being in a position to possess nuclear weapon. And that leads me to the last point before I sit with Sharon for question. It's missing opportunities. I've seen in many cases that because the international monitoring system is so well functioning and because we are a victim of our success, people say, why do you need the treaty to be enforced? You can detect, you're working well, you have an international monitoring system, a verification regime in the build-up, nearly completed. Why do you need entry into force? You're doing your job already. But we need entry into force because what we've achieved is so fragile. It's so fragile that if we don't have a legally binding framework where this treaty in force can allow enforcement of law behind this treaty, everything can fall from one day to another. And that's why we need the CTBT in force. And that's why it's important to maintain and sustain what we've built. That's why it's important to work with all the countries, the remaining Annex II states. And when I talk about the remaining Annex II states, I often say there is no 800 pound gorilla and 250 pound gorilla. All the eight remaining states are on the same level. Any ratification from those states can help lead the way for others. And this is why when people ask me among the eight, which country do you think for two years I've been saying Israel? I still believe. But I think now I tend to turn on China because we've been progressing with China with regard to data and certification of station. And I think China has shown so much leadership in this world today that maybe it's time that they show leadership in this field, in arms control, so that they can lead the way for other countries to follow and then we can get this treaty into force. Then people will say, yes, China and the United States might ratify. But what about North Korea? Do you think even one day that the DPRK will ratify this treaty? My answer to this is, I hardly believe that if we have all the nuclear weapon states that have ratified the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, that will live in a framework where one country can hold the treaty uh, without its entry into force. I don't believe that a second. What we need it's a consensus among those nuclear weapon countries about the treaty. A consensus that this treaty, as Sharon mentioned, represents an important piece in framework of the NPT. Framework of the NPT, do you guys know that only this year, after so many years, that we are allowed to even talk at the opening of the NPT PREPCOM? People would say, there's rules of procedure. There's no rule of procedure. Show me. There's no rules of procedure. It was a practice. But if you don't set precedent, if you don't move, you know, borders a little bit, we'll never achieve anything with the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. We have to talk about it. We have to educate people. We have to explain why this treaty is important, why its international monitoring system serves the international community. And we have to be patient, but we have to be constructive, put constructive pressure so that we can move slowly and slowly to achieve the entry into force of this treaty. To conclude, what I would say is that we live in a historic moment when the rules of the game, not only within the Beltway, but also globally, are being re rewritten. In the realm of arms control, the fabric of the treaties that assured strategic stability and predictability is under duress. Yet, the time of change is not only about challenges, but also about the opportunities. I look forward to today's discussion about possible opportunities on how to move forward to the entry into force of the CTBT. With your insight on what can be done 
in the United States and globally, I'm sure that we can secure a future for the CTBT. And Sharon, this is one opportunity that I didn't want to miss, and we need many more of those to push this treaty towards its entry into force. Thank you. Well, thank you um, so much. I have a lot of questions, but I also know we have some actual negotiators of the CTBT in the audience who have uh, uh, likely questions of their own. So I'm going to be brief in my own uh, remarks. What happened with China? <laughs> so, so uh, you know, China is supposed to have how many stations? 13? Yes, yeah, 13. 13 and, and so what, what was the breakthrough? And... Uh, Breakthrough, I don't know if I should call it breakthrough. I think, like many of you would know, uh, it takes time to negotiate with China. Mm -hmm. I think that is, uh, when I, my dealing with China reminds me of how uh, we deal in Africa. Mm -hmm. You know, it's about trust, and it takes time to build trust. But when you secure a minimum of trust, you get what you want. And I think that has been our process with China. As Director of International Data Center, uh, together with my colleague at the time uh, from the IMS division, we travel uh, to China uh, to uh, secure the buildup of the stations. We build the stations. And uh, at that time, the interpretation was different. Like many, some countries today, the point was we don't share data until entry into force of the treaty. Mm -hmm. And that has been a debate at the beginning and at the build-up of the international monitoring system. So it takes time to convince people that if you don't have data, how can you be sure that the system is working? Mm. How can be, you be sure that you're improving? The, you need data to be able to improve your system. And the PTS, the Provisional Technical Secretariat in Vienna, our role is to prepare the technical and political means for the entry into force of the treaty. If you don't have the data, you can't do that. And uh, there have been also a share of knowledge between China and the Secretariat in Vienna. We've had now more Chinese experts working in the organization and then more interaction with China to have been able to build a trust that now leads China to accepting the certification of the station and then transmitting data uh, for the good of the international community. Mm -hmm. So um, there, there's one operating now. There's f there will be four more next year? No, there are five that are okay. currently sending data. Okay. Okay? But sending data is not uh, uh, the only point. You can send data, but the data will be in the test bed until the station is certified. The certification means that the station fulfill the technical specification required to be part of the international monitoring mm -hmm. system. And this is what we're planning for four more stations this year in China. Okay, and that, uh, that certification requires an inspection? Indeed, or? we have uh, for certification, we have technical experts from the Secretariat that will travel to China to check the functioning of the station. We have to test the data for a period of time to make sure that the data is stable, reliable, and then fulfilled uh, some of the authentication that are required for the station to be fully certified as part of the international monitoring system. Mm -hmm. um, if I may ask one more question before I open it up to the audience. You mentioned that the detection level is, is lower or better. Mm -hmm. Uh, than originally anticipated many years ago. What are the key factors that led to that? And my second qu follow-on question to that is, what's the technology that you're most excited about? You know, as you look forward, certainly CTBTO will be able to take advantage of technical developments in a lot of different areas. Okay, and the detection capability, I mean, uh, several factors. When, uh, and Pierce, who has been in the negotiation, uh, will, uh, will probably say this, it was a design, it was a concept. 
and the concept was done with few tests in, uh, in Kazakhstan to try and calibrate the equipment and the technology that will serve for the international monitoring system. But the reality wasn't there. Now we have the reality and technology as evolving, processing capability and processing techniques are evolving. And then we're realizing that uh, some of the station, I'll give you an example. When an event happened in the Korean Peninsula, we have stations as far as Peru or Niger in West Africa that will have detected the event. People wonder, oh, how come 1,000, 10,000 kilometers away you can detect? You don't have to be next to the peninsula to detect an event. Because we work by triangulation. You need three stations to be able to confine an event for it to be an event that goes to the bulletin that we have. So I would say technology, uh, the density of the station, and then the fact that what was designed was only a concept, but not the reality. And now we're facing the reality with evolving technology that are making uh, the results of our uh, detection capability far lower and far better than what was anticipated. Because sometimes when I say far lower, people think that I'm talking about not as good. No, it's better. Yeah, it's better. <laughs> and, <laughs> and new technology that you're excited about? New technology, I would say satellite imagery mm -hmm. was something that has never been part of the, the international monitoring system. Not because people didn't want, because at the time, Pits, it was seen as too expensive. Okay, that was one of the points. But today we have satellite imagery in our iPhone. Okay, so whether we want or not, experts in Vienna will use it. And if you take the Monterey Institute, and then I take uh, uh, our friend uh, Jeffrey Lewis and Melissa Hallam, they're doing a lot with satellite imagery to basically support the international monitoring system and worldwide verification. So I think I see satellite imagery as uh, something important, but I think uh, beyond satellite imagery, you need the technical specificity of an event. Because with satellite, it's not because someone is moving tons of equipment towards a tunnel that is necessarily conducting the test. I think the example of the couple of, I mean, the past months have shown that satellite imagery was uh, uh, basically certifying that there would be a test in the next two days or 48 hours. It didn't happen. So you do need the international monitoring system and the four technology that we have to substantiate whatever might come from satellite imagery. Right. Exactly. I mean, they basically complement each other. Right. I would like to open up the floor now to your questions. Don't be shy. In the back, please. And Hi. please just uh, announce who you are and who you're with. Uh, my name is Ben Russick from the uh, US National Academy of Sciences. I was involved with the uh, 2012 uh, uh, CTPT report that the NAS uh, published. Um, I have a question. You mentioned um, Israel and Iran as, uh, excuse me, uh, Israel and China as possible, um, possible uh, you know, countries that might that you'd like to see ratify the treaty soon. And um, you know, I, I uh, in this in this city, um, you know, people are very concerned about Iran, and I was curious to to hear about your outreach efforts uh, in Iran. Um, Thank you. Iran, you know, before, uh, if the CTBT was included in the GCPOA, I would say Iran would be next. The question is why wasn't it included in the GCPOA? The GCPOA is an excellent deal. But I think we missed an opportunity. I mean, as head of the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty Organization, I mean, you won't blame me for that, for saying that it was a missed opportunity to have not included the, uh, the CTBT as part of the GCPOA. But in fact, Nikita, uh, one of my uh, colleagues who is sitting here, has asked Foreign Minister Zarif that question. He said, the GCPOA is fine, what about the CTBT? His answer was loud and clear. Let's see how the GCPOA bear fruit before we move on other arms control treaties. So, it's now used as a leverage. So why didn't we include it? And that is something that I've been debating with my staff, including today. I'm, and I've been of the view that the CTBT should have been included in the broader scope of nuclear security. If that was done, we'd have a framework where people see 
the full scope of issue in nuclear. Any nuclear issue includes security issues should include the broader scope. If that was the case, maybe there was room to put or to include the CTBT in the GCPOA. But the other point is, there, are still two, there were still two members of the discussion in the GCPOA that had not ratified the CTBT. It was probably difficult for them because people would say, you better clean at your doorstep before you tell me that mine is dirty. So it was, I think, the group was in a difficult situation to impose or even to propose the CTBT as part of the deal. It shouldn't have been because I think when uh, uh, Iran talks about the fatwa not allowing them to develop nuclear weapon, if you don't put it at the beginning, don't come when the negotiation are near completion to say now we want to include the CTBT because then there's a trust issue there. It should have been right, right, right at the beginning. And this is a key problem with the CTBT. We tend to deal today in arms control and non-proliferation or disarmament in silos. Exactly. Okay? As long as we continue doing this, we will not secure the entry into force of the CTBT. We even forget that the CTBT is a low-hanging fruit. I mean, there was an opportunity not to even talk about the CTBT at the opening of the NPT this year. But have you seen the number of countries that have talked about the importance of the CTBT in the framework of NPT? Many. But if we don't respond by having the organization being relevant in such discussion, the statement of those states are going, of those countries are going basically like, you know, underwater. So we need and we have to maintain the relevance of this treaty if we think it's important for arms control and the framework of non-proliferation and disarmament. So, will Iran ratify? Yes, I think Iran will ratify the CTBT. As Foreign Minister Zarif said, let's wait and see how the G where the GCPOA takes us. So now maybe, uh, for me, the only thing I can do is to pray that the GCPOA is maintained and then that the GCPOA uh, you know, lives on that beyond the 10 years, we see the importance of the CTBT for after 10 years of GCPOA. Because that's one of the questions that we're asking ourselves today. What happened after 10 years? If we want to secure or understand what happened after 10 years, we should prepare it today. And preparing it today is to getting a situation where we can get Iran and all the other states to ratify the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. Amen. <laughs> we have a, we had a question up front here. Uh, thank you. My name is Paul Walker uh, from Green Cross International. Um, nice presentation, Lassner, and uh, and thank you too for your good leadership of the CTBTO. Um, I want to ask you about the IMS stations. Uh, you know, the IMS system, the International Monitoring System, is a it's a wonderful development, and I think it's what 90 or 95 percent now deployed throughout the world. Um, where do we still need it in the world? Uh, and are there specific countries that have refused stations and continue to refuse stations? I had other questions too, but I'll leave it at that. Okay, thanks. Uh, Paul, uh, thank you uh, for your question. And then uh, uh, when I talk about opportunity, I, you know, I better thank Paul as well, because Paul invited us to be part of uh, what I call the, the global picture, to include chemical weapon, biological weapon, and nuclear weapon. That's the type of thing that we need. And thank you, Paul, for organizing a session like that in Australia. So are there countries that refuse to build station? Uh, as a scientist, I would have said yes. But as a diplomat, I would say no. <laughs> OK? Yeah, I know. That's why you ask. So, so since we are in diplomacy, let me say no. Okay, no country refuses to build a station. But countries are possibly using it as a leverage. Okay, I was talking and I'm still talking to some countries to secure uh, the build up of their station. They often tell me, oh, do you think uh, those nuclear weapon states are serious about this treaty? They don't care about the treaty, they want the data. Why do you want us to build our station and then give data for free? This is what the type of 
answer you hear from some of the developing countries. And rightly so. You know, I was in, uh, in Ecuador. It took a long, long time to convince the government of Ecuador of the importance of the international monitoring system facilities. Because Ecuador could have argued that in the Galapagos, no way you can even build or dream to build a station there. But they've done it. Because we managed to work with them and then to build the trust necessary for them to accept implanting facilities of the international monitoring system in the Galapagos Island. We have to do the same with other countries. We have stations to be built in Egypt. In Iran, by the way, we have a station that is certified. And that's something that many people forget. But a station that is not transmitting data today for many other reasons. But a station, we went up to certifying a station in Iran. And that's something that we should capitalize on. A station in India to be determined. And when we talk about India, I think that leads me to a point. It wasn't your question, but I'll, uh, I say I, I never miss an opportunity. I'll use that opportunity to talk about one other topic, which is the debate that even came to Carnegie about should India and Pakistan be bound to adhering to the CTBT before joining the NSG? As a scientist, I would say yes. But as a diplomat, I say, OK, look, there's a way to get them to join the NSG that could include the CTBT. But include the CTBT how? The point is not to ask India and Pakistan to ratify the CTBT today. The point is to get India to be less allergic to this treaty, to be accepting that there is room to build a station in India, a to be determined station, and then to build upon <coughs> Pakistan observership to the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty for them to sign the treaty. How to get those two countries to be together in a way where they feel comfortable in considering adhering to the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. The ratification is the next step. But we have to start somewhere. We cannot be asking all or nothing. We have to use every single opportunity to make every little step. And this is what I believe in. Other questions from the audience? Hi, thank you very much. I'm Kathleen Delano. I'm the uh, CEO of PMIC and an evangelist for U.S. government s and and basic research. And you mentioned working with the labs and uh, something you mentioned uh, subsequently, I have a, a quick question. When you said the um, uh, station was certified, could you expand what certification you mean? Mm. Uh, question one. Uh, and question two is perhaps talk a little bit about um, how the work you've done with the labs, which happens to be you know, my area of real interest, working within the DLD labs to form the foundational basic research that is then transitioned out and given freely, ties into your innovation message. Because it sounds as if you're talking about translating into cultural norms understanding and applying empathy to a scientific method or a scientific process or a business transaction that has hitherto been done from an ethnocentric perspective. OK. Uh, I'll start by, by this one. It's not only uh, empathy. There is a, a lot of work that has been done with the lab. Uh, the last one is uh, the re-engineering of the application software of the International Data Center in Vienna. That's a project that I started as director of the IDC. And that's why, together with the US now, we call it phase two of the re-engineering of the IDC, International Data Center application software. Why? We started the project to improve our processing capabilities and technology in a way to adapt them to this 21st century. Because things are evolving. Cloud computing, cloud storage, I mean, you name it. If I take cloud storage, how do you convince people on the security of putting data from the IMS in the cloud? That's a topic to be discussed. But what we had 
under the scope of our technology refreshment, we've been developing new tools, and countries like the United States see value on the project that we started, and then they join us not only in funding, but in expertise. And that's what we've been doing now. Ten years ago, it was one-way stream. They tell us how it works, and then we use it. Now, it's we're figuring out how to work the solution together. And the United States is using more data and product from the IMS and the IDC today than ever. In the past, they had their own monitoring technology, own monitoring system. There are 15 countries that, with which they have bilateral agreement and then feeding them data. But those 15 countries are not serving the entire planet. Now, you have 90 countries that represent 95% or 100% of the international monitoring system at your disposal for use. Now it's about improving the science behind it. And improving, that helps as well because we had a National Academy of Science assessment of the, the, the International Data Center and then the IMS. That was in 2012, I guess, the last one. That concluded that the treaty is verifiable and that 2012 already, there was a conclusion that we're in the right path. I can tell you in 2017, we much better off than we were in 2012. If there was an assessment today, I think people would be surprised. I've often hosted uh, both sides of the Senate in Vienna to brief them on the international monitoring system and the international data center. But trust me, people have often been surprised at the capability of the international monitoring system and the work we've done in Vienna. I mean, they all come, they, they come out, they say, oh, we didn't know you guys did that. Very little people even know that in 2013, only the IMS was able to give the radio isotope that was correlated to the event in the peninsula 54 days before. This is basically the value that we're bringing. So it's not about just exchanging and enjoying Florida, as I told you. Uh, <laughs> but uh, it's, 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 far, it's far beyond this. Do we have time for one more question? I think there was a, another aspect to the question. No. Did yes. I forget there was? Uh, it's it's fine? fine? Yeah, OK. Certification. No, certification. Oh, right. Certification is simple. We build stations. They send data. But we have a protocol in the international monitoring system to serve the international data center with specifics and specific technical specificities. A station from IRIS is not necessarily a station that can serve the international monitoring system because we have a technical protocol. To fit that technical protocol, we have to certify a station to say that this is indeed now a station that serves the purpose of the international monitoring system. That's what certification means. Okay. So we had one up front, and then Mary Beth did you have a question, and that'll be it. Hello, Mishko Popovic from AIS Engineering. Um, I had a question regarding the technology, and uh, that is related to the number of nodes, IMS nodes, that you mentioned about uh, probably north of 350 around the world. Uh, we are now entering the third phase, third decade, basically, of the uh, CTBT network. Uh, and obviously, over this time, the number of nodes have been growing around the world. What is the projection at this time, now that we are entering the third decade, uh, as to the growth of uh, new centers, new IMSs, new nodes around the world, particularly as related to uh, the new and progressive medium, such as satellites, that we are using, because obviously through the growth, uh, there may be some areas that may not currently be covered by the existing satellite network. Okay. Um, we have a framework for that, even in the, in, in the treaty, uh, what we call cooperating national facilities. But you see, as Sharon mentioned, the difficulty sometimes in diplomacy is that if people are not ready to build the station that is designed by the treaty, will they be ready to accept the cooperating national facility that improve 
the system. And this is the debate that we have in our technical working group. But we're getting there because we have many countries that are requesting to build station. Those stations will not be part of the IMS because the IMS is a concept and a design. But those stations will be what we call cooperating national facilities that will serve the IMS but not be part of the IMS. But they will complement the work of the IMS. Why countries are asking for such station? In the Gulf, we have many countries requesting radionuclear station because they see the value of station from the IMS. But the beauty of the cooperating national facility is that, to answer your question, they would be certified because they will fit the purpose of the IMS and then they will meet the technical specification of the IMS and hence serving the purpose of the verification for national technical means. One thing that we should emphasize here is the role of national technical means. The CTBT and the IMS was not built to work on its own in a vacuum. It was built to complement national technical means and that's why capacity building is so important. Because when we talk about national technical means, how many countries have national technical means in the world today? A handful of countries. But we need more countries to be able to understand the technology behind the street, the technology behind the verification for them to trust the system, for them to trust the treaty, for them to work for its entry into force. So what we need is indeed to develop the cooperating national facilities and then to help countries to build upon their national technical means to serve the purpose of verification. Because the more they do, the better they help the treaty. The more they do, the better they complement the international monitoring system. And we buy anything that complements the IMS the same as we buy everything that help us to get to the entry into force of the treaty. The last question. Um, Thank you. I'm Mary Beth Nikitin from the Congressional Research Service. Many questions, but I'll keep it brief. So I'll invite you to Vienna for the rest of the questions. We should put her Thank you. up here to answer questions yeah. about the U.S. Congress. <laughs> so, um, Keegan, you make sure she comes to Vienna. <laughs> Thank you, and he is always very good about answering my questions. Um, <laughs> So today I just wanted to ask, um, do you feel you have the resources and the personnel necessary to meet these challenges, especially if developing countries are asking more and more what's in it for us on other applications of, of their um, stations or of the data? Okay, I'm going back to my way of answering. As a scientist, no. As a diplomat, maybe. <laughs> So when I say maybe resources, uh, one has to take into account that uh, when the treaty was negotiated and the design of the IMS was made, it was anticipated that the treaty would enter into force within three years. And within three years, the amount of staff in the organization will go up to 600. That was a projection. We now 300 doing this fantastic job for the international community. But people are not falling apart because they're committed, dedicated. But in terms of resources, any operating facility would tell you we need more resources because the better you have in resources, the better you perform. And the better you reach out in terms of capacity building, especially what you say, how do we get the developing countries to see value in this international monitoring system? I mean, I'm from Burkina Faso. We have a national data center. What is in there for them? You think people will sit at the NDC in Burkina and monitoring the planet in search of potential nuclear test explosion? Obviously not. What we want is some incentive for those scientists working with the data from the IMS to see value in it. What else is in there that we can use daily or regularly so that we so well trained that should an event, a suspicious event happen, we're in a position to advise our national authorities. And this is why capacity building is so important. And this is why we've insisted that we have to build more and more capacity because this is the only way to build trust so that the 183 countries are fully part of the international monitoring system and the treaty. We're sharing data, we have 183 countries but we're only sharing data to 130. Some they've signed, 
and or ratify, but they're not using the data as they should. There is work from our side to be done so that all state signatories of the treaties benefit from data from the IMS and product from the IDC. And that's a challenge. And that's what we're working on. And that's what we're trying to do. Well, um, if I may say that the CTBTO has been blessed by having um, a series of very articulate and persuasive executive uh, secretaries, uh, including yourself, um, even though the CTBT has not entered into force yet, uh, your presentation gives me hope that um, we're, we are all working hard on the same page. So thank you so much. Thank you, Shelley. Thank you. Thank you.